So this talk, it is kind of uh, taking back the shells where they belong in the sense that you know, we, we, we've been talking so much about Beyond Shells with the fantastic dedication of our living gallery back, um, which is almost a year ago, that we, we opened Beyond Shells with the live octopuses and gastropods and the fantastic uh, achievement on the part of the museum. So what I want to do today is bring back shells, shells as objects. Maybe we'll have to talk a little about the animals that make them in the process, but most of all, we'll be talking about shells today. And I hope you enjoyed the, the, my view of the story. And I just want to make a parenthesis here. Uh, this is our landing page. I just copied, that's the way it is today. At least it was an hour ago. So I think it is, it's the way it is today. And I have a little reminder for you also that on Wednesday, November 18, this great museum celebrating its 25 years of, of officially opening. The museum actually opened in June, on June 27, 1995. But the grand opening, the dedication of the museum by the mayor of Sunnybell back then, uh, Wally Kane, was on November 18, and that's the day we celebrate. So keep that in mind. We'll be doing a kind of a modest celebration given uh, you know, the pandemic, we are open, socially distancing. We'll be offering cookies from Bailey's uh, to our guests uh, on the way out. We don't want them eating cookies after they come, to, you know, as they come to the museum. So celebrating 25 years. But let's go back to uh, to the talk that uh, we'll be uh, be having today. So this is what I, I decided to do. And I, I decided to do this like maybe about four months ago when I was first invited to uh, to give this talk. So it's more or less a free form talk where I, I share some of the things I like about shells. And I know that some of them, you know, I mean, I'm talking about them before. Some of them are kind of new developments. I include also some of the cultural uses of shells, which is something that I'm very interested in also. Karen mentioned that I started as a sheller, not as a scientist, but as a shell lover when I was very young. And I lived like two very short blocks from the beach. And I was immediately enthralled after I found my first seashell. The whole thing, why? I mean, we don't know the shapes the collars, the way they you hold them in your hand, and, and there's no two ways about it. The moment you go through that, you're hooked. And I, I know you guys are. The shell crafters, the scientists, the shell collectors, the enthusiasts, we're all in the same boat, aren't we? Let me just go and over a few facts about shell. You see here in this image, some of actually the second largest local gastropod, a horse conch, a very small species that cannot, I don't know if you can find that locally, but you can find it in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is about a shell that's about uh, less than a half a millimeters, which is about two hundredths of an inch. My point here is that between the largest local gastropod and the smallest local gastropod, we have a, a difference of 1,200 times. So the smallest gastropod you can find around here is 1,200 times smaller than the largest one. Isn't that fantastic? Those animals, they, although they share some very similar body structures and all of that, they have to be intrinsically very different to be able to live lives in those extremes of size. This is also another local species of gastropod. It's a uh, tornid. Phyllis and I go back and forth with the tornids. It's a very difficult uh, family and there is a huge number of species here. We have about 22 in our shell guide in the website uh, and there are many, many, many more yet to be found. Well, this guy here is a little smaller than one millimeter. And remember, one millimeter is four one uh, hundredths of an inch. So it's basically the size glorified grain of sand. Most mollusks are actually small, half an inch in size. Most gastropod species are smaller than, keep that in mind. So when, uh, when I say sometimes I tell people that we don't know exactly what species we have, we have living. We don't know all the species that we have living here um, off Sanibel Island or even, even in the, that we can find on the beach as you scoop a, a handful of sand, bring under the microscope, you, you're liable to find species that have, have not been named yet. So um, shells have a very special way of growing. The mollusk body is growing. And in, in order for that mollusk to be able to profit from the protection afforded by a shell, he or she will have to add more shell, make the shell bigger. And, and the way they make the shells bigger is by something called accretion. And accretion is ACC 
R-E-T-I-O-N, involves adding more material at the end. Pretty much like a place, like imagine a beach such as the Lighthouse Beach on Sunnybell. And gradually, we know that that beach is growing right now. And it grows by accretion because more and more sand is added to the very edge. That's the way a shell grows. And here is a little model that shows just that, uh, the shell growing by addition of more shell material at the end. And uh, this is one of the classic slides that I really like. It's from Tucker Abbott's uh, Seashells of North America, my favorite shell book. It's the little green one and now it's white. Um, and it shows a cross section of a shell here and with the outside, the periosteum, you know, that fuzzy, hairy, sometimes layer, brownish usually. And, and then the different shell layers and the actual mantle of the mollusk inside. So this the outer mantle fold, it's, it's, it's what makes the shell. It keeps adding, keeps adding in, in bivalves, you keep adding more to the shell at, at the very um, edge in, in gastropods, adding more at the aperture. And here is a diagram showing that with the periosteum outside. So I'm, I'm showing that to show you that I've had a lot of people asking me questions about uh, how do uh, how does a, a mollusk or a gastropod that have a shell with spines, how do they do that? You know, um, same thing for a bivalve that have spines or knobs or, well, here I have one of my, literally one of my favorite shells. It's almost like a cliche, it's everyone's favorite shell, the Venus call Murex, Murex pectin. Uh, they look like, uh, you know, they render the shell, the aspect of a fi the fish bones, a dead, you know, a dead fish. You can see a cat holding onto that, they're running around in a back alley. Or... Here, I have a detail of the same shell showing you a more or less the structure of the spine, just to show you that there is a furrow right here. I hope you all can see that. And that represents the place where the soft part that makes the shell is called the mantle, you all know that. And the mantle here, um, at some point forms a projection, pretty much like a long finger, and it will then add shell material around itself. And here is the seam that results. So if you can break that, you notice, you notice that that spine is hollow. And that's true also for um, <clears throat> gastropod shells that have knobs or shells that have tails and all that. It's the mantle that's making all that. And th this is an extreme case where the mantle can form those little projections that will make the uh, spine from the inside out. Here, this, those are actual local um, alphabet cone shells found by uh, museum's Lauren Buckner, who was always out looking for trouble, if I may. I mean, looking for cool things to ask questions, and he's always bringing, you know, interesting stuff. And this is one of the things he brought last year, the two shells, two alphabet cone shells that were naturally broken, exposing the inside. And when you look at the inside, you notice that there's something missing there. The part of the, the internal columella, which is the internal axis is, or shaft, is dissolved. That happens with many species of cone shells that are able to resorb that is to pick up the shell material and reincorporate that into the system and make new shell with the old shell material that they just dissolved. Isn't that cool? There's a, a couple of reasons why they, they do that. One is that uh, they no longer need to have that structure inside. Their shell grows in a way they don't, don't need to have that strong shaft inside. And the other is that it adds uh, more living space that otherwise will be limited by that bulk of the columella inside the shell. Sometimes you may be looking for cool shells and that pristine off of that cone. Keep in mind that the very bad, the very beat up also yield cool information in case you're looking for that. This here again is, um, is on a uh, Caribbean fossil cone uh, shell. And that's a study by John Hendricks, who was here at the Florida Museum for a while. Now he is at the Paleontological Research Institution in upstate New York. He did a very cool, cool study showing the effect of UV light revealing coloration color in very dead fossil species. So this is a, I think it's a Miocene species of cone shell that's probably about 20 million years, 20 plus million years of age. You can, you can see faint markings here in the fossil shell, pretty much like some of the Florida fossil shells. When you, when you throw UV light onto that shell and take a picture, you end up with something like that. And if you do a negative of that and print or look at the negative, then you have something that according to John is very close to what he estimates would be the real color of the living species in that shell. So uh, we know that we've been talking about that for a 
decades here in the museum, we do, you guys probably know it, that if you throw a, a black light, ultraviol ultraviolet light onto some special fossil shells, that the color pattern is revealed, that some colors glow really golden or orange. We actually have a black, uh, UV light down in our exhibit hall that shows just that. I thought it'd be cool to, sh to share this. Uh, some of you may have seen this paper. Um, another cool thing about shells, and this is, was found only recently, it was found about um, around 2001, a, a species that we call, uh, informally we call the scaly foot snail, only named in 2015 by a group of, uh, international group of scientists led by Chong Chan, who's a very productive uh, young scientist working in Japan now. And, uh, the scaly foot snails is a species that may incorporate metal both into the shell and also in those protect protective scales that they bear on, on top of the foot. So basically they have protection afforded by iron. And in this case, it's a, it's a uh, composite called iron sulfide. It's a mixture of sulfur and iron. This, this species lives in a spe very special area, some very small area, the size of two football fields in the Indian Ocean uh, because of the size of that area and the fact that that area now in the recent past has been explored for extraction of valuable minerals by the Chinese and German conglomerates. The species now is in the red list of endangered species put out by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So I think it's the first marine snail, first marine mollusk actually that's officially given as endangered. Well, this is a subject that um, I like to talk, and, and again, uh, some of you may have heard me talking about this before, is the fact that although in some species of mollusks, the young shell is, looks very much like the adult shell. And here, the best case scenario in a very well-known species, one of actually, to me, an iconic species, lightning whelk, simple as that. In the lightning whelk, the young individual, as, as little as one eighth of an inch, even even less than that, uh, will resemble very much the adult shell. And this is because they, they spent the, the whole uh, growth inside an egg capsule and come out as a, a crawling, a miniature of the crawling adult. And this is part of one of our exhibits open in 2016 that I worked with Dory Hipsman to put out and they look really nice and was a very good use of um, donors um, resources. We put into the, that battery of exhibits together in 2016. Now, let me go back to what I was talking. Uh, what happens with lightning whelks that the a young shell looks just like a miniature adult. Doesn't happen often. In many, many cases in mollusks, um, the young mollusk or young gastropod in this case, and I chose the example of abalone is here. They, they will look totally different. The shell will look totally different. And this is because in some species, the young stages of the life, in the life of that animal are spent in the open water where we have a planktonic larva versus the adult, which lives on the bottom. Uh, let me explain. Planktonic are small individuals that drift in the middle of the water. They may be able to swim feebly, but they usually they carry by water currents because they're very small. Uh, the counterpart of planktonic will be benthonic, and those are what most mollusks are. Abalone is living on the rocky shores of California, are typical benthonic or benthic individuals. So they have a adult life on the bottom and the babies in midwater, if you will. And when they are at that stage, their shells are very different from the shells of adults. You may have seen that before. We have a special type of larva in mollusks called the veliger larva that's exclusive to mollusks. That's one of the things that unites mollusks. In principle, they all have this type of larva. And when they are at that stage in open water, the shell of the veliger larva looks very different from the shell of the adult gastropod or bivalve. And, uh, and that's the adult. I'm circling the larval stage with a red circle or a red oval and the adult with a blue blue collar oval. And that will carry on to the next uh, slide. The many faces of one species, in this case, showing how distinct uh, the larval shell of a cowrie looks from, from the adult shell, this being the Atlantic gray cowrie luria scenario. Very distinctive. Uh, this species has a larva that may spend like a month and a half in open water drifting in the plankton. This here is this Caribbean species, a droop in the family Myricidae, and took those pictures many years ago under an electron microscope. Because of the mode, the, the way that gastropod shells grow, you know, they grow from the top here, adding more and more shell to 
as they grow, grow larger. Uh, in some cases, when you you're able to find a well-preserved shell, you may be able to find the remnants of the larval shell that we call the protoconch, which is the initial shell. And in this case here, the protoconch is very elegant. This is how the larval shell looked like. Uh, this line here, I hope you can see my little arrow, my little cursor moving here. This little lip here is the end of the larval stage. When that little guy fell from the water and settled onto the bottom, starting to live as a crawling, productive, I like to use the word productive, gastropod, you know, a healthy life as a, as a crawling gastropod in contrast to the life uh, in the middle of the water. Another species, and that's very curious because uh, this has been a sundial. Uh, we all love sundials. They, you know, they are they're a good example of a cool shell to hold in your hand, right? I mean, it, they're really super elegant. Well, sundials have some, I mean, sundials have a planktonic larva, a larva that lives in the middle of the water for a while. And the cool thing is that the planktonic larva of a sundial grows in one direction. It grows down this way, and when it settles to the bottom, it turns around and begin will begin growing the other way. So it goes like that, and then at some point it moves back like that. So that if you look into the umbilicus, the hole here in the base of a uh, sundial shell, you'll see the, the apex of the larval shell. Isn't that, I mean, think about that. It's not easy at, to grasp at first, but that's a very cool thing that the, uh, the sundials in this family and their family can do. This here is a, um, one of the very large gastropods, it, it, the Atlantic trumpet triton, a close relative of the Pacific trumpet triton. Pacific uh, counterpart is grows a little bigger, but we also have a very large shell here on the Western Atlantic. Actually, the museum holds the world record that species in our worldwide shells, a uh, record shells exhibit. This here is a shell on the right. You know, you can see the the brown part here is the shell made by the larva, and the pink part is after it's settled to the bottom. Bottom. Now this shell measures about, I would say about three eighths of an inch. And I had it here in the collection for many, many years and didn't know what it was until we received a collection from Colin Redfern, who was a very productive collector who wrote a couple of books on Bahamian seashells. And in Colin Redfern's collection, he had several stages of the Atlantic trumpet triton from the Bahamas, including one that was very similar to the one I was not being able to identify up to that point. So, uh, and that shows how we know that, you know, this thing grows to become that is by looking at growth series. It'd be very, very hard to grow that into an aquarium because they have very specific food habits. But when you have a growth series of a particular shell or particular species, you, you're able then finally to understand uh, what that little guy was to begin with. I'm, I hope I'm being clear with those um, presentations here. This is something I really love. And it relates to the, the life habits of the animal. You have to you have to understand a little how mollusks reproduce and then appreciate the, the different life stages. Um, let's talk a little about the use of shells by humans. I started by saying that we all have something, we share something in common. We like the shells and then because we like shells, we, we expand. Some of us like to do things with them. Some of us want to learn more about their lifestyles and all the things they do for a living, which is super cool too. And humans have loved shells for thousands and thousands of years. And I think this still holds as the uh, oldest example of use of shells by prehistoric humans. So that's a, a species of mud snail in the genus Nassarius from the Red Sea and Mediterranean. And it was dated as being 91,000 years of age and was found in an archeological site. I mean, between 30, 73, thousand and ninety one thousand years of age showing how uh, how old the use of shells by humans is and i'm sure there's stuff out there that's even older than that so apparently those mud snail shells they were drilled or holes were made onto them and possibly for use as a necklace or some kind of strung together shell type structure. And they are basically about a half an inch wide. Uh, these pictures I took in a uh, complex in a place called Te Teotihuacan, pretty close to Mexico City. It's a, a very uh, well-known archeological site of which they know very little about actually. There's, other than what's there, there's not much known. Uh, about the culture that uh, the people that did it, and, and it's assumed to be aged between 2100 and 1350 
years of age. And here, uh, they, they pay a tribute to what we believe is a queen conch. It's, it's in, a, in a, an area of the temple, uh, the temple uh, under the temple of the sun, uh, what they call the, the gallery of the feathered jaguar. The jaguar uh, has been a, a very important icon in, in Central American cultures. And this jaguar, to me, is even more is even more cool because he was blowing a uh, queen conch trumpet. And we assume, I mean, they're local archaeologists, and I think they're probably right, assuming that this is a queen conch shell. In around the same area, we were traveling there about six years ago, and I saw this actual trumpet made of a real queen conch shell uh, with different kinds of stones and, and obsidian glass and all cut. And I was interested in buying it. I says, well, um, how much? It was the equivalent of $200. So I just walk, up, walk around to a nice picture to show you. And, uh, but I just want to show you one of another, um, another local uh, modern version of the, the um, shell that I showed you before with the Jaguar blow, also in central Mexico. We talked a little about lightning whelks. And lightning whelks are a uh, basic staple of spirituality, if you will, uh, throughout North America you know, for, for many, many, many years. Uh, there's a lot of work being done by Bill Marquardt and Karen Walker from the Florida Museum of Natural History, uh, who are good friends of mine, and Laura Kosuk, uh, who is with the Illinois Natural History Survey in Springfield up in southern Illinois. They published a very interesting paper on the lightning whelk. Uh, and then you can see here the title. And, uh, and they traced the history of lightning whelks and different different other different whelks, like the channel whale, in places far from the ocean, in uh, archaeological sites and temples and all that. They narrate several tales that have been passed from generation to generation in Native Americans. And it's a very interesting shell, and there's a lot to it. And a lot of that is related to the way that it, it, it grows um, in, in a sinistral fashion in, instead of a dextral fashion. Uh, this is another whelk, apparently not a lightning whelk because it's a uh, right-handed, but it comes from an um, archaeological site in uh, East St. Louis, which is just across from St. Louis, across the Mississippi River. i actually been to that place, and uh, it's called the Exchange Avenue figurine, showing the, you know, the involvement of um, natives with, with that species, which is also a as I said before, a basic icon. I mean, a staple of our, so to me, it's almost a, there's not a day goes by in the Shell Museum that we don't talk about lightning whales. Going uh, to the farther, more distant place, uh, cowries now. <clears throat> and uh, I haven't spoken about cowries yet, but there will be a little about cowries because they are really cool. I mean, they're cool objects when you think of them. Cowries have been used as currency, you know, for centuries and it's still used in some faraway um, Southwest Pacific Islands. The center of, um, the use of cowries as, as money uh, centered around the Seychelles and the Mauritius Islands. And um, that's where they, they gathered a lot of the shells that ended up being used as currency um, all throughout Asia, the Southwest Pacific, all the way to easternmost reaches of Polynesia, such as Easter Island and all that. Um, here, I have a picture that uh, shows a uh, contemporary uh, picture showing a, a, a different use of cowries, which is the use of cowries as objects for divination, meaning that uh, it pretty much has tarot uh, cards that by throwing cowries, uh, those uh, you know, individuals, usually female individuals who are uh, who have special powers, they can tell your fortune, your future, and, and, and depending on how they fall in the relative positions and all. That's only cowries are used for that purpose. Came out of West Africa and it was transplanted to uh, places in the Caribbean and South America and the US where slaves from um, were brought from West Africa. They brought all those traditions with them. I have actually seen people doing that back in, in my home country. Well, objects of ornaments, um, those are people, uh, peoples from uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, at some point, uh, we received a large collection of photos um, of, of shells in, in Southwest Pacific uh, cultures. And I really liked those that, you know, lots of cowries, usually the money cowry was one of the basic staples. And also there was a value, an intrinsic value. It's pretty much like making a, your, you know, um, Halloween costume or your ceremonial costume, your wedding gown made of $100 bills, if you will because those, uh, those cars are worth money to, to the very people who are wearing those, um, those um, outfits, 
shouldn't be using the word costume um, in, in this case. Um, this is a piece we have here in the museum that I found, find to be extremely, ele extremely elegant. Um, it um, consists of manikari shells making a, um, uh, I think it's a, a necklace, um, it's, it's a, or, or like a chest plate, almost necklace slash, slash chest plate because it's so large, from, also from Papua New Guinea. Um, going into the European um, uses of shells and a classic one of that, and using a very special species of shell, the artisans in, uh, in Europe have created uh, what we know as cameos. And the main concept, if you will, main idea there, is to use a shell that have layers, shell layers of different colors, so that um, knowing uh, how deep to etch or to carve, uh, you're able to, knowing what you're doing, you're able to um, create those beautiful patterns of a uh, light color figurine against a darker background. Um, you may be able to do that with different species, but it seems to me that most of the cameos we 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 see in our collection of we have a small collection of objects like that are made of um, with uh, the bull mouth or also no aka as a red mouth helmet or red helmet um, supercasis roof um, even in contemporary art uh, car is to make uh, make their presence known and this is a exquisite uh, kind of strange and different um, figurine made by um, a uh, Scandinavian artist using small cowrie shell. This is something that really, you know, there, there again goes by uh, having to show off. And uh, it's actually a, a friend, a, a person who became a friend because she brought uh, her um, little son here. And I helped with, you know, a school project. And, and as a thank you note, she sent me a, what I consider to be a really elegant woodcut uh, celebrating the species that was named after, after me, you know, buried me now with that. And, uh, and here is the species, Epitonium leali, uh, named by um, my friend Emilio Garcia from Louisiana in 2011. I think that uh, it, it's a pure artistic form. It's, it is, it's not supposed to be a scientific drawing, but I think it captures the essence of, of the shell that was named after me. I really like it. Anyway, that's, I need to show that, show off. And then again, elegance and elegance in shells. This is a, uh, one of the, the Anatomicus um, group. I always have a dilemma when someone asks, what's your favorite shell? Imagine people ask me that question all the time. And I have a, a special group of um, droops that I like a lot. And also those, those murexes that look like bones, almost like parts of a skeleton. And this one, again, is a good example of people, if you don't know how a mollusk makes a shell, you have trouble envisioning that. But if, after the explanation I gave you about the Venus Comurex, I hope you understand a little better now how the mantle will form a projection of itself. It projects itself and gradually makes this object here, this, uh, not object, this, this uh, expansion, this extension of the shell. And then it draws back before it can do a new battery of those from like spines. We use of shells by humans, an iconic species, what we call the St. James scallop or Mediterranean scallop. That is the shell used by the pilgrims that did the way, I mean, the 500 mile walk pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela in, in the part of Spain that's um, very close to Portugal, actually. On the, it's on the border of Portugal. And that shell, very attractive. It, to me, it's, a, it's super elegant. It has this balance to it. You know, the, the beautiful, beautiful common shell, but very beautiful. It was used by the pilgrims, um, not only as uh, it's used today as a symbol, but in the distant past was used as a cup so that they could fetch water in the, the water springs along the way. That, that's one of the many, many uses. The shell is known as a symbol for St. James, known as Santiago in, in Spanish. And there are, uh, there's at least one, one small church in that area that has the outer walls all covered with this shell, which is very, I should have found a picture of that to show you next time. Um, and again, uh, now going away from the cultural use to a more pragmatic interpretation of the shell is the fact that a shell like that is a good example of a very strong engineering structure because it has this notched, chamf chamfered shape. And that shape is, I'm not saying that the shell was used as a model by uh, modern engineers, 
but it is a good example of a structure that's very strong because of the shape, the inherent shape. And here you can see a metal, um, quote unquote, tiles, metal plates used in commercial industrial roofs that have the same shape. This shape lends itself to becomes extremely rigid. If you have a wind blowing, a hurricane, it, it's very hard for this to bend because of the, you know, the folds here. And I think this principle also applied here with a shell that's extremely strong and resilient because of because of its shape and the cross section. Um, again, I mentioned the strength of the shell. Here is a cross section of a um, volute, a deep water volute. And I took this picture many years ago under a scanning electron microscope showing this particular arrangement, which is pure engineering uh, on the part of nature in the sense that there are crystals, almost like fibers. The only difference is that they are not flexible. They are, they are calcium carbonate crystals, and they are deployed by the mollusk in alternate layers going one this way, the next this way, then again that way, again that way. That gives the shell itself tremendous strength so that a predator trying to bite into that or trying to crush that shell may be able to may be able to do it, but it will be much harder because of this particular structure. And that's another reason why I like shells. Talking about shell layers and shell <clears throat> ultra structure, that's a classic example. Some of you may have seen that. And those are quahogs. If you slice those quahog shells, take one and slice them, and then you polish the resulting surface along this line here and take it away in two parts one, two, and look now at the resulting surface. You'll be able to see something like that. Actually, I took this picture here in the museum. This shell was, was sectioned by a scientist at Iowa State University names. She was looking for local shells to do studies in environmental conditions. And I'll explain to you, some of you may know that, but uh, those quahog shells, they will incorporate minerals from the water at the time when the shell was being made. And the minerals in the water and the water conditions, the temperature and all, they were not the same as they were being made as 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So what I'm saying here is this shell has the ability to people who know how to read them or to listen to them. They have the ability to provide environmental information. And that's exactly what she was doing. Not only that, but if you look at the bands, dark, light, and the dark band is really narrow, the lighter band is wider. Here in Florida, in the summer, the water gets very hot, very warm. I mean, actually, in some places in the shallow bays uh, areas, it gets to the mid 90s um, and even higher, depending on how shallow it is. The, the animals go into a, a very, very um, lethargic, if you will, stage, and they slow down the growth. They still make shell, but the shell that they make is different when they are stressed. And then when the good season comes back, you know, the fall begins, and then we have good winter and spring, and then another summer here. So if you count the number of dark bands, which equals summers, then you know how many years the shell has lived. And this is another cool thing about shells. If, you know, I want you to think of every single shell in this, in your collection, actually, in our collections here in the museum, every single shell as an environmental recorder that can tell you, if you know how to look, can tell you that a that uh, that animal lived, you know, up to the point that it died, but also in some cases can yield um, information about temperature of the water and also the salinity of the water and it, whether or not there was uh, some kinds of pollutants in the water and all that. And that's one of the main uses for collections in the long run into the future as uh, things change a little bit at the way they're changing now. By using that methodology of counting the rings here, like tr tree rings almost, you know, where you can count the tree rings to gauge the age of a tree, you can also gauge the age of very long living uh, mollusks. And, and the longest living mollusks that we know of at this point is the ocean quahog, a species of bivalve. Actually, it's a com commercial species of bivalve up in cold waters. And that species may live to be older than 500 years of age. Shell structure allows some shells to be used as window panes in some, some of the Asian uh, cultures. And those are actually modern objects made with uh, the placuna, which is known as the window pane oyster. And the reason is that they, they are made of a special type of shell layer that is translucent. So if you look, if you pick one shell up and look against the light, sunlight, you see the light coming through. And that, that's um, 
that's very cool. But also, not only that, but um, for for the thickness that that shell is, that is a, a very, very strong shell because of the kind of structure that they have. Uh, one of the things that I did in when we went into lockdown a couple of months um, between, I guess, between May and June, I created using some uh, images from our um, digital imaging project, a new poster that we hope to be able to have for sale in, in the near future called Cool Florida Shells. Not necessarily rare or not necessarily common, just a, a melange, like a, a blend of cool things from both sides of Florida, Florida Keys and the Panhandle. Um, I thought it was a appropriate moment to show you that. So going back to the, you know, you notice this is really a freestyle talk. I go in many directions, but I'm hoping, I, I hope I'm keeping your attention here and your uh, enjoy for your enjoyment. I talked about loose coiling in one of my blogs recently. It's something that's really fascinating because loose coiling is a situation where the shell has a very regular growth. You know, it's, it's not like a worm snail that goes all over the place. This is a number of different species in several different families where the each whorl doesn't touch the next one, giving this aspect of that we call loose coiling. And this is a special kind of nutmeg in the family Cancellaride that's super elegant. It's the Miller uh, nutmeg from the Eastern Pacific, this one from Guaymas, Mexico. That one, I, I actually had it, I think I had it in my creator's corner, in my blog. It's a small, and surprise, surprise, it's a small sundial that has an almost flat type of coiling. It's not really flat because it does go a little this way, but it's clearly a shell where the whorls do not touch each other. It's super elegant. Um, it's small. It's, um, this is a, a millimeter line here, so I would say that this shell is probably about uh, a little less than a quarter of an inch this way, but uh, I thought you'd like to see that. I found this here, and I hope I can get it to work. It's a 3D model of an Ekphora, and, and they, they have an interactive system here that um, lets you... So now, if this is something uh, that uh, I am the one doing that. You can move it in any direction. It's, it's, it's a three-dimensional three view of a, one of our beloved uh, Ekphoras, which is a, a type of Murex um, fossil shell that you find. Um, uh, mostly along the eastern seaboard of the U.S. from the Miocene and on some of them from uh, Florida, from, from the Pliocene. Um, I encourage you to do that. Later I can send the um, link to that. And, uh, and there are other species that, uh, that uh, you can do that with. So I just wanted for you guys to see that, you know, it's a cool use of a new technology to show a shell from all angles. Very useful when you're dealing with types, when you want to do shell identification and all that. I think I saved the cowries for the last. I want to talk a little about cowries because they're really the paradigm of a cool, cool shells, right? You can hold them. Uh, they feel nice when you hold them. Um, if you are uh, if you have cowries, a medium-sized cowries, and if you're having a bad day, I strongly suggest to pick up that cowrie and hold it, you know, and just, just hold it. And I think you'll feel better. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I can't remember. I've, I know I've done that. Um, and they are really, really nice looking. Uh, the shape, the way they, you know, not to mention the biology, the way they grow and all the diversity. I have a, uh, the centerpiece here is a fossil, a fossil curry from Australia that we have in our uh, cowries exhibit downstairs. And it's called the Zoila gigas, gigas from the Miocene of Victoria. And now a very rare shell because the, basically it was only found in a spot that uh, belonged to one individual. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It sounds like some of the fossil pits in Florida where the guy at some point said no one comes here anymore. It's, it's gone now, they, no one can get them. And it's a shell that can grow to be about six, seven inches in size. And then I, I kept telling people in the beginning that that was the biggest species of cowrie. And then uh, at some point, someone came to me and said, don't tell anyone, but you're wrong. There is a cowrie in Europe from the Eocene of the Paris Basin, which is a very shelly fossil outcrop, if you will, right around Paris that's bigger than that. And it can grow to be, uh, I think it grows to be just about a little, a tad longer than 10 inches in size. And it has this fantastic sh uh, shape with the prongs here coming out. And this is not a, it's not man-made. This is a real fossil shell. It looks almost like someone invented that to pull our legs, but it's a real shell. So I will leave you with a couple of things. I wanna just say that, um, 
you know, we have a bunch of different educational programs that you guys help support. And I'm very grateful for, I, I, don't, I don't stop saying that for all the help you've given the museum over, you know, going back before the museum opened, very consistent consistently over this many years. These pictures here are pictures of uh, children's drawings. I was a judge for a cool, uh, wide, um, actually Lee County wide contest a few years back, put, put out by the Cape Coral Library. And I was just blown out of my mind when I saw the things that children were doing, can do, you know, because they don't have any limitations in their imagination. They just go wild. This is a tar, um, a star shell um, that we call now Australian. Australian phobium. Uh, that was a knee here, but that's okay. And the lightning whelk again. Um, um, I want to call your attention before I let you, let you go and that we have a lot in our website, especially for those of you who are new Shell Club members. Shellmuseum.org uh, has a wealth of information, uh, not only the ongoing programs, you know, inf information about our living exhibits, the Beyond Shells, um, a ground floor, which is a state-of-the-art aquaria, but uh, also my Curator's Corner blog, which I've been doing for many, many years. It has uh, is about uh, 496 entries now, you know, about local and non-local shells. Um, and again, I'm going to bring it. This is live here. I hope you, um, this is the way it looks. This is the Curious Corner as of uh, today. It is a couple of things celebrating the museum that came out on Friday. So it's all there under the blog here. The next slide, the Shell Guide. Uh, the Shell Club has specifically given, uh, given help, financial help, so this thing could be developed in the beginning. Uh, right now, we uh, cover 396 local, I think 394 species local species and including many micro mollusks. Um, it's a good resource. There are lots of information on not only on the shell, but whenever possible, whoop, on the living on the living animal. Uh, so that uh, let me go here and show you. So if you click on um, you know this type of um, limpet, the cayenne uh, keyhole limpet, you'll be able to see pictures of the live animal, the picture by Amy Tripp, um, and so on. So that's the other one. It's here on the shell guide. Uh, see, last but not least, for those of you who are really serious about um, local, uh, I, the idea of local shells, our entire collection is online, and it's uh, what we call the web portal for the catalog. And I just want to show you quickly here. I do not have pictures for the entire collection. The entire collection spans 130,000 um, holdings that we call lots. But right now we have almost 3,000 um, of those um, with images. And I'll just give you like a, to add your appetite. There are 3,000 of those images, many of them you know, consisting of composite images with um, you know, sometimes seven different images put together. Here we have six images for a, a local. Um, so you get the drift, what I'm trying to. Uh, very high detail, and this is our um, digital imaging project. I think last time I gave a talk to the Shell Club, I was showing uh, some results, the initial results. We have now uh, most of that done. Um, and uh, with that, I think I, I will leave you. Uh, I want to go back to one of Dave uh, Horton's cartoons. Hey, I can hear the city. It's a, a little Florida fighting conch holding a skull. And all the opposite of or the in contrast was trying to hear the, the ocean holding a shell. And, and uh, with that, um, I don't know how you want to proceed if you want to let people write their questions or ask questions. Um, the one we have from Connie says how fascinating it is that the column of a gastropod is partially self dissolved to access shell material for new growth and make room. But she says, why does the apex of a lettered olive? blow out seemingly so much more than other gastropods. Even young ones are commonly found with a hole at the top. I, uh, I yeah. really don't know in, in that case. And uh, uh, usually that happens. You know, I'm not, not, talking, not talking about specifically the latter olive, but in, in gastropods in general, including land snails, that if the protoconch, you know, that little initial, let's go back here and the little initial larval shell that will stay behind on top, um, if that is is light and thin, that will go pretty fast. So that's why this particular shells here are so unique because I could find some that had the protoconch preserved. Um, in many cases, they are much, much, much thinner and lighter than um, the adult because they, being that they are 
planktonic, that they are drifting in the water, the animal has to carry that for protection, but also has to carry extra weight. So they are much thinner. And when, once they settle to the bottom, we call that metamorphosis. It's pretty much like a butterfly because it goes from one type of animal to a different um, type of animal in the same species. Type of animal is kind of a rude, uh, crude way of saying, you know, a, a form of animal within the same different stage. Um, that, that protocol, that larval shell is thinner. That might be the reason why it happens in in leather olives. Um, um, there are some species of land snails that you can never find. They can actually break breaks really low. There are some species of book cynids, it's which are well, some, some special kinds of small whelks that you can never find um, the initial whorls. They all kind of clip off and mostly because they are um, they are um, very fragile and what's left behind. In some, some of those cases, the animal can go back and plug that hole. And uh, we have, you have a lot of that here in the collection. They can go back up there, quote unquote, and plug. It's like you had a, your chimney flew out on, on, your, on your roof and there's a hole, you go back and patch that. Um, that that's what they can do. Another thing I forgot to say is that um, you all, do you guys know nerites? Nerites are, we don't have them here on the on the West Coast, but they're very common on the East Coast of Florida. They're kind of heavy round, they look like moon snails. Well, nerites also do that. They totally dissolve what's inside so they can make more space for themselves, carry less weight and still have the full protection of the shell. So it's sort of like remodeling your home. So yeah, <laughs> great. Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know that wall, I don't like that wall anymore between the kitchen <laughs> and the living room in space. So thank you so much, Jose. That was wonderful. I'm going to remind people that if they come up with a question or if they look at this on our website in the future and they have a question that they should feel free to email you at that time. So